Thank you, Lana. Thank you to those who have shared this morning. And Jan, good to see you this morning. It's good to have Jan Godan in our service. So God is good. Thankful for you being here this morning. If you have your Bible, I know that your bulletin shows Psalms 22, but if you read Psalms 22, it really doesn't go with the title this morning. Actually, it's Psalms chapter 33 is where we are, verses 13 through 15. When I saw that and I read Psalms 22, uh, yeah, that'll make your heart stop. But we are in Psalms chapter 33 this morning, and we have just another Sunday after today as we Uh, conclude this series together, His Powerful Names. We've been looking at the names of God. This morning we want to talk about how He is El Roy, how He is the God who sees me. And so here in Psalms chapter 33, verses uh, 13 through 15, you'll notice our text of Scripture this morning, Psalms chapter 33. You can follow along there on PowerPoint as well. Let's all stand together as we read in honor of God's Word on this Lord's Day. The psalmist says in Psalms 33, verse 13, The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of His dwelling, He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. Father, thank You for Your Word today. Thank you that you are a God who is so personal, a God who is so intimate, a God who is so close, that you are a God who sees us. Every person here today, every person watching online, there's not one person anywhere that you don't see. You are omnipresent. We thank you for your ability to be with all of us as we gather in this place today, but also as we go our different ways during the course of the week. Father, remind us of this great truth today. We thank you for the privilege to worship you through song. And Lord, as we worship you through preaching and hearing and responding to your word, Lord, may we be obedient in all ways. We pray this and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share how God sees you and me, how that ought to give us great comfort and how that ought to give us great peace. There's not a second of any day There's not a second of any night that we are by ourselves, that God is always present and He has promised us that He will never leave us alone. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6, the writer says, For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That our God is committed to His children. Uh, He is emphatic regarding the commitment that He has made to us. Jonah prayed a while ago thanking Him for sending His only begotten Son that He is so committed to you and me that He sent us His very best in the Lord Jesus Christ when He was born and He lived and eventually made His way to the cross called Calvary and He rose from the dead. In fact, All the time He has helped us. Think about all the times He's been there for you and for me. Dr. Tony Campello tells a story about when he was young. He was living in a big city, and his mom had arranged for this older teenage girl to walk him to school and to walk him home every single day. Well, she was going to pay, him, pay her to, to do that particular task. And Tony was only in second grade at the time, and he told his mom, you know, he decided to kind of engage in this conversation. He said, Mom, how about we do this? How about I walk myself to school? How about I walk myself home, and you pay me the money, and I'll be really careful? I mean, he was a negotiator, wasn't he? Some of you have children like that. And after some begging and some pleading, uh, little Tony finally got his way. Uh, For the next two years, he walked all by himself to school, all by himself to home, at least he thought. And it was an eight-block trip and with many streets to cross, but he was real careful. He didn't talk to any strangers. He looked both ways before he crossed, and he didn't get distracted in any way. Well, several years later, this has happened probably to most of us, where they're at this family party, and and Tony was now in his mid-40s, and he began to think back and pull up this story from a long time ago and and brag about his independence to his family and, and how he had taken care of himself as a little boy. 
And as he was just about to finish that story, that conversation, his mom began to smile, and then she began to, to laugh out loud. And she told him, she said, Do you really think that I would let a, a second grader walk eight blocks in a big city all the way to school and, and all the way home by himself? She said, Do you know that every morning when you left for school, I left with you? And I got in the car, and I was just enough ways behind you that you didn't even see me. And, and I followed you all of those eight blocks to school until you walked into the front door. And then in the afternoons, I parked. I guess she was kind of you know, hiding out. And then she said, I followed you all the way back home until you finally got to our front door. She said, I would have never left you and allowed you to, to go through those things alone. She said, I never said a word. But I was there in case you got into any trouble and if you needed me. At every turn in life, He is there for us too. He is not only with us, but as Christians today, we celebrate the fact that He lives in us. Because we have trusted Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. It was A.W. Tozer many years ago who said, Nothing in or of this world measures up to the simple pleasure of experiencing the presence of God. That when we invited Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, we invited Him to live inside of us, not in a bodily form, but we accepted Him through the power of His Holy Spirit that you invited Him to live in your life. He is inside of you. He's inside of me as Christians. And it's incredible to consider that God is so close and that He sees us. That in a world with an estimated population of 8.2 billion people and growing every single day, that he knows your name. He knows your address. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're facing. He knows the ups and downs that you have known this past week. And he knows you and he knows me. In Psalms chapter 139 and verse 1, the psalmist says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge, he says, is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I mean, the psalmist was overwhelmed by the intimate presence of, of Almighty God. And even though God's presence is so amazing that sometimes it is nearly indescribable, we would also to say, say today that it is incredible. Like the psalmist, we thank him for loving us in such a personal way because there is no other God, small g that is, that is intimate like our big G kind of a God. And it's only possible through our Savior Jesus Christ. But today we know that the Lord not only looks and sees us, but He is active in our everyday activities. He just doesn't stay in heaven and, and sit at the right hand of the Father and, and sees everything that is taking place and does nothing at all. But He is active in your life. He is active in my life. And so today as we think about how God looks from heaven and He sees us, it ought to give us great peace. It ought to give us great hope. It ought to give us great strength. And so, so the first thing I want you to notice today is that he gives us strength. Look what he says here in Psalms chapter 33 and verse 13. The psalmist says, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. The psalmist rested in knowing that the Lord was his strength as he faced various uh, struggles and, and opposition, that there was no one who was greater than his God. In fact, in Psalms chapter 121, in verses 1 and 2, he would say, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, we must know where to look. Uh, sometimes we look at our trials. Occasionally we look to ourselves or we look to a, another person. But God wants us 
to look to him. It was Hudson Taylor, the uh, starter of the China Inland Mission, the founder many years ago, who said many Christians estimate difficulties in light of their own resources and thus attempt little and often fail in the little they attempt. He goes on to say all God's great giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on His power and presence with them. That we have all of the power of heaven. And the question this morning is not what are our problems. The question today is where are our eyes? Where are our eyes? Because as believers today... As we think about a God who sees us and what we're facing, our eyes ought to be different. Our eyes ought to be unique. There was a prominent atheist named Matthew Paris who wrote an uh, an essay about a strange phenomenon that he had observed in Africa. And amazingly, as an atheist, he wrote this essay for the Times and he titled it, Why Africa Needs God. And although Paris made it clear that he does not believe in God at all, he admitted that Christianity made a tangible difference in the lives of the people that he knew across Africa. And not only did he admire the good work that Christians were doing to take care of the poor and to take care of the sick and to take care of the needy, but he also, as an atheist... He he paid us a compliment. He also liked the way that they looked. And he writes, these Christians were different. Their faith appeared to have liberated and relaxed them. There was a liveliness, a curiosity, an engagement with the world. And he goes on to pen, whenever we entered a territory worked by missionaries, we had to acknowledge that something changed in the faces of the people we passed and spoke to. Something in their eyes. Something in their eyes. You see, we are filled with the strength of God. We know that nothing is more powerful than Him. Even the biggest obstacle is an opportunity for the Lord. In Matthew chapter 15, We find a woman who approached Jesus who was facing a huge problem. Her daughter was demon-possessed. And this lady begged Jesus to have mercy and to heal her daughter. And in verse 25, the Bible says, Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. You see, she did not know what to do about her daughter, but she definitely knew where to go about her daughter. So she went to Jesus, and she asked Jesus for help. And as a result, in in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 15, the Bible says, Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. This morning, what is your challenge? What is your dream? What is your setback? This morning, what is your impossible? Because not only do you see it, but listen, God does too, and He is a difference maker. He gives us strength. But not only does He give us strength, but secondly today, He gives us hope. Look what He says in Psalms chapter 33 and verse 13. The psalmist would pen, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from the place of His dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. Every one of us has, is, or or will face a situation that looks completely irreversible. And the good news this morning and every other day is that those episodes that we view, we do so with optimism because of the hope that we have in Jesus. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, Paul says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that as Christians we are the most hopeful people in in all the world? That we have a God in heaven who is so powerful. He created the heavens and the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh. There's nothing our God cannot do. He, he gives the blind sight. He gives the mute the ability to speak. He even raises the dead. I mean, nothing is impossible with our God. 
And when we begin to get a view of him, it gives us great hope. Because hope is the medicine that God uses for Christians who are discouraged, depressed, and defeated. Do you ever feel that way? All of them in the same day? There's times when you and I, we feel all of these in the very moment that we're in. And in turn, as we think about God seeing us and how God is active in, in everyday life, it begins to turn our discouragement and us being depressed and being defeated and allows us to have confidence, to have courage, to have a new commitment to face our circumstances. God gives us hope. In other words, when we begin to dwell on Him more than we dwell on our circumstances, and we dwell on Him more than we dwell on ourselves, we are reminded as the people of God that God is a powerful God, and it gives us hope. There was a famed cardiologist who said, Hope is the medicine I use more than any other. Hope can cure nearly everything. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that hope can cure just about everything? You know what I believe today? That hope in God can cure anything. It can cure your heart and it can cure mine. And we can either, hope, we can either choose to hope in ourselves we can choose to put our hope in other people. Listen, we can choose to put our hope in our material possessions or our accomplishments or our education. The, the list goes on and on and on, but unfortunately those things, they, they don't last forever. Or we can put our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in a God who does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. We would say that He is our changeless God. Because there's moments in life, there are a lot of moments, maybe you're in that moment today, when we just need a little bit of hope. We need God to fill us with the hope of knowing that we're not alone, that He looks from heaven, He sees all the sons of men, He knows what we're facing, and God is simply with us. Charlie Brown de decided to play baseball, and so he signed up to, to join a team, and unfortunately the team was terrible. I mean, it was a really, yeah, I played on a few of those teams, and uh, you probably did too. I hope I wasn't the one that made it terrible, but this team was terrible for Charlie Brown. And so one day he told Lucy, he said, there's just no hope for our baseball team. And Lucy said, well, Charlie, you, you win some and you lose some. Charlie Brown responded. He said, well, that would be great <laughs> if we won some and, <laughs> and we lost some. It's all this losing that gets real hard. You know, real hope can only be found in God. We can try hope in ourselves, hope in other people. We can try hope in a lot of different places. But that's not real hope. It's temporary hope. And sometimes it's superficial hope. Our hope is in Him and knowing that God sees us, He's active, and He's in control. That's why Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is so powerful for us today. Paul would say, and we know. I mean, he was convinced by this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. It may not look like it today. Paul didn't say it always looked like everything was working together but that's where you and I trust in God. And we know that He is always at work. We may not be able to see it. And a lot of times we can't see it with our human eyes. But we trust the process, don't we? I like to say we play the long game. We trust the process. And we know that in the end, God always wins. And all things do work together according to His purpose according to his will we know that God has a purpose in everything even though we may not fully understand and our hope is in a God who loves us you see God sees us he gives us strength he gives us hope but also today can I remind us that he gives us faith here in Psalms chapter 33 we're reminded of these verses again where the psalmist would say the Lord looks from heaven he sees all the sons of men from the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. 
He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. God has proven to us that we can trust Him with everything. That there's not a moment that He cannot be trusted. That each of us should ask Him for greater faith. Listen, the greatest faith in all the world is, is saving faith. It's childlike faith. To know Christ as our Savior, to trust Him with our eternity, that takes the greatest amount of faith because we're trusting Him not just in this life, but we're trusting Him with forever. In Matthew chapter 21, in verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, then do not doubt. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. The confidence that comes with God seeing and help, helping us increases our faith to a brand new level. It takes it to a new dimension. Because we believe more than ever that we can trust Him. That we can put everything in His hands. It was J. Oswald Sanders who said, There is no conceivable situation in which it is not safe to trust God. He couldn't think of one. This great theologian couldn't think of one instance or one obstacle or one problem in which it was not safe to trust God. Can you think of one this morning, one area of your life, something that you're facing or going through where it is not safe to trust God? See, God wants us to trust Him all of the time, not some of the time, not most of the time. God wants you and me to, to trust Him all of the time when things are going wonderful. And when things are going awful, right? When we have a break on Thanksgiving and when we have to go back to work and school on Monday. I mean, God wants us to, to trust Him all of the time. When the sky is shining and, and the sun is bright, and as we would say, when the bottom falls out, listen, in those extremes, God wants us to trust Him. Turn your Bible to Mark chapter 4, if you will, with me. I often think about the disciples in in Mark chapter 4, who got into the boat with Jesus so that they could cross the lake. Now, several of these men were experienced fishermen before they laid down their nets to, to follow Jesus. And so they, they were a whole lot better in the boat than, than some of us. But you'll notice that this great storm arose and, and they were afraid. They they needed faith. That's exactly what we need in the storms of life, knowing that God sees us. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, do you see it today? The Bible says, On the same day when evening had come, He said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. That was their promise, by the way. Now when they had left the multitude, they took Him along in the boat as He was. And other little boats were also with Him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, the problem with the disciples is the same problem that lies within every single one of us from time to time. The issue was not the storm that was around them. It was the fear that was within them. They were afraid. The Bible tells us that the waves began to beat the boat. The wind was picking up. Here Jesus is on board, but he's taking a nap. I mean, when you're the master of the sea, you don't really worry about storms that come. And obviously he knew that it was on its way. But they were fearful. In verse 40, look at it again. 
He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? In other words, after all that they had been through together, after all that they had experienced, as close as they were to him physically and now spiritually, how could it be at this point in their lives that they didn't have more faith? Can I say this morning that it's the storms that challenge our faith in God and not the moments of calmness? The storms are sometimes our best classroom to learn to have faith in God. That's where real learning begins to take place. And God uses those storms, doesn't He? He uses those challenges. He uses those setbacks and those difficulties to, to allow us to grow in our faith in Him. And as a result, God gives us many times greater faith when we lean into Him that is stronger than the fiercest storms that helps us to overcome, but not only that, to have greater faith on the other side of whatever it is that we're going through in life. He is El Roy. He is the God who sees me. And because He sees us, it ought to give us strength. It ought to give us hope. Listen, it ought to give us faith because we know that we don't live this life alone. We don't live this life independently all by ourselves, but God sees us. But not only does He see us, but He is active in our everyday lives and all that we go through. The next time you face something that is a challenge, you ought to just stop and pray. Maybe this is a different prayer and say, God, thank you for seeing me. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you that I'm not alone. Thank you that I'm not all by myself. God, thank you that you see me in this situation. And God, I ask you for your strength. God, I ask you for your hope. God, I ask you for your faith that you would walk with me during this time. There's some ways we can live this out on this Lord's Day. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to know his presence. To know his presence. God wants to live in you. He wants to live in you. And this morning... You can invite him into your life. You can ask him through a prayer to be your Savior, to be your Lord, to live inside of you forever, to have the, the strength and the hope and the faith that you need. Listen, he will live there forever. He's come to give you life and life more abundantly. He'll live there now and throughout all of eternity. This morning, you can know his presence. To say, God, thank you for seeing me, but I want to, to know you. I want to have a personal relationship with you through your son Jesus. This morning, would you come? Would you say, I want to know his presence. I want to become a Christian. But also to see his presence. If you look around, you will see him. If you take a good look around in your life, you'll, you'll see him. Look for God's presence in your life. Even in the difficulties. Even in the hardships. And ask yourself, Lord, where, where are you working? Where are you moving? Where is your hand? Thirdly, recall his presence. Think back to all the different times that you've seen him. To take a trip down memory lane and, and remember what you've gone through. And to see his hand, to see his activity in your life. To remember the ways that, that he has been present. How he's always been there for you. I mean, if we think about it, there's never been a moment of any day when God hasn't been there. When He's never been there. God's always been there. Now there have been a lot of people you thought would have been there. And they weren't there. But God's always been there. He's always been faithful. He's never abandoned us. He's never left us alone. And then fourthly and finally you see it there. Feel His presence. You can feel the presence of God. That through prayer. Through worship. Through Bible study through getting quiet with Him, be still and know that I am God, that we are intentional in practicing the presence of God. Today, we ought to leave this place and say, Lord, thank You. Thank You for the reminder. I know that You see me. But Lord, thank You that You are omnipresent. Thank You that out of all the people in this world, that You see me and You see You and You and You and all of us right where we are. And Lord, as I go out into the world tomorrow, back to work, back to school, doctor's appointments, maybe you have something that's coming up and you're fearful about, Lord, thank you that you see me right where I am, right where I go. And Lord, help me to be reminded that I am never alone, right? Never 
never, never alone. There's not one second of any day or night that I am alone, that, Lord, you are with me. He is, listen, he is the greatest Savior and the greatest friend in all the world. In those moments when you are alone and it seems like no one is there, God's always present. He sees us and he is active in our everyday lives. We ought to thank him for that today. Father, we bow in your presence this morning. We thank you for being El Roy, the God who sees me. But Lord, as I just mentioned, not only do you see us, but also you are active. We thank you that you are not like some other small jig type of God who sees us and can't do anything. You are a God who is in heaven, a God who is everywhere all the time. And Father, in this place today, as we go our separate ways this afternoon and tomorrow and throughout this week, you're with every single person. We thank you for your activity as well. We thank you for your presence. And we pray that today that you would help us to practice your presence. I pray for those today that need to know your presence. They need to trust you as their Savior and Lord. They need to invite you to come into their lives, to live inside of them, to experience this personal relationship, this journey with Christ. Irregardless of age, Father, whether there's a child or a student or a young adult, a middle-aged adult, a senior adult, all of us need to invite Jesus to come to live inside of us. And Father, we know it's personal. It's personal. And so we pray for those today. I pray for those who have never hit pause and acknowledged their sin and their need for a Savior. They've never taken that moment and invited Jesus to come and live inside of them. I pray that today that they would, as we begin to sing in just a moment, may they come forward, give them the courage that they need to say, I want that kind of relationship with God. I want Him not to only see me, but I want Him to live inside of me. I want to have this relationship with Him. I pray for us Christians today because sometimes life can get a little discouraging. Sometimes life can get a little hard, get pretty tough. And Lord, we thank you today in those moments when we feel alone, that we're never, never, never alone. We thank you for your powerful presence today. And may that truly give us strength and hope and may it give us faith. Pray for those, Lord, that are looking for a church home today, a place to grow, a place to serve, a place to give their lives away. If you're leading them here to First Baptist Youngsville, I pray that they would say yes to you on this Lord's Day. We pray this and we ask this in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the greatest name in all the world, the greatest name that has ever been mentioned, that's ever been uttered, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Won't you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?